image classification. Image classification is one of uh, two areas in remote sensing that really are the must-have uh, tools and uh, techniques for um, anyone who's working in this area between image classification, which density slicing is a form of image classification, manual image classification, and change analysis. These two technique areas are really necessary for um, mastery of fundamentals of remote sensing. So the problem that we're trying to solve with uh, image classification is the, uh, particularly this form of classification that, that we're going to be starting on um, this week, uh, is the problem of complexity, the complexity of remotely sensed imagery. So in remotely sensed imagery, you know, we have this incredible level of complexity. In Landsat thematic mapper imagery, for example, that, that we've all looked at and worked with, uh, the imagery is that, that we work with, the raw imagery that we work with, is a, uh, is 8-bit data. So in other words, the data is scaled within each channel to an 8-bit integer ranging from 0 to 255. This is what you get with 8 bits or 1 byte. So in six channels, in each pixel, we get 48 bits of data, 48 bits. So what's the complexity of 48 bits? So let's think of uh, just the visible and near and mid infrared channels in Landsat 7. So channels or bands 1, 2, and 3 are the visible bands, blue, green, and red. And then channels 4, 5, and 7 are the near and mid infrared channels. And so with those six channels, we get 48 bits. How much, what's, what's the complexity of that data? How much information is there in each pixel? 48 bits gets us an incredible amount of complexity. In, uh, in a TM image, in every pixel, every 16 days, and this is, this is the imagery that was collected from uh, the early 1980s until the present day. Actually, we're still collecting it, although it is degraded somewhat with Landsat 7. Here's, here's what we get. You can, you can have up to over 281 trillion possible values in each pixel. Uh, and this, this level of complexity is just, it's, it's overwhelming. It's something that we really um, have a hard time uh, understanding and, and, and being able to sort it out. What, what's the difference between one pixel and another pixel? With Landsat 8, we have an even greater level of complexity. With Landsat 8, we get up to, and this is just with the first eight channels, excluding the thermal infrared, with 16 bits in each channel, we get up to 2 to the 128th power possible values. That is uh, just an incredibly enormous number, uh, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power. So this complexity is, it's, it's a problem that uh, we have to solve, and we have to solve it in a way that produces information that, um, that will be useful, useful to us 
and useful to others that uh, maybe um, don't have the um, you know the ability to work with this these data directly. Uh, so we want to simplify complex information. These these are the purposes of classification, and e even with density slicing, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to simplify complex image information. We want to create new information, new value, right? And make it easier to interpret. We want to find known land covers in areas that are not accessible. This is another purpose or possible use of classification. And we can also use it to analyze change, to analyze environmental or uh, cultural uh, human change, right? So the types of classification, there's different ways to uh, think of different forms of classification. There are a lot of different approaches to image classification. Generally, we classify um, different approaches to classification as either unsupervised or supervised. In unsupervised classification, you more or less, um, you know, there are a couple of different techniques for doing this. And you, this is more of an exploratory technique. And what you do is you'll, you'll take an image, again, a, a multispectral image with, could have any number of channels. You can, you can classify imagery with three channels, but uh, ideally, you, you know, you want to use as much information as you have. And so um, we typically use just about everything that we have. Sometimes we exclude the thermal channels. But the, in unsupervised classification, you take a multispectral image and you basically just tell the system how many different classes you want and you turn it loose and it works through an iterative process that produces uh, clusters of different similar pixels that are similar in their reflectance. Uh, and, you know, because that's mostly what we're looking at. We're looking at reflectance across the visible and, um, and infrared spectrum. And so then after it does that classification, this is in the unsupervised approach, you then have to figure out, okay, what is this cluster? So you probably go to the field or do uh, image analysis with, um, you know, high resolution aerial imagery. In supervised classification, which probably is the more uh, commonly used uh, approach to classification, this is this is the the approach that you take when you know something about the area that you're uh, classifying, and uh, sometimes you may even have particular targets or types of land cover that you're trying to identify specifically, uh, rather than trying to identify all of the land cover in, um, you know, in a, a particular region. And so in supervised classification, uh, the analyst knows something and you, 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 you set different training sites where the system takes samples and uh, it, it takes samples of the reflectance of these different training sites that are are typical of a particular type of land cover that you've identified, and it, and it uses those samples. It develops a statistical analysis of those samples and uses those to analyze every pixel in the image and to determine how many um, how how uh, determine on a pixel by pixel level what each pixel is most likely. Uh, identified as within the different training samples that you've identified. So typically, when you when you do supervised, you may have anywhere from just a few uh, training samples of some specific land cover types you're trying to identify up to you know 20 or even 30 um, different land cover types. That that's fairly typical. Anywhere from a very low number up to around 20 or 30 classes would be about the most that certainly that I've I've ever seen. We also classify uh, approaches to classification is as, uh, and this in, in particular refers to supervised classification as either hard or soft classifiers. So hard classifiers make firm decisions regarding classification of a particular pixel. In other words, they don't really have any 
um, fuzziness or or um, you know uh, transition between one class and another class. And then there there are also soft classifiers or algorithms that do classification that we would we would identify as being soft in that they allow for more uncertain uncertain uncertainty between classes and uh, allows the classifier the analyst to um, really put some flexibility into their classification into the decisions that are made around classifications so just starting out here's an example of um, a classification just to just so that you understand more or less where we start and then the kind of uh, product that we're maybe looking for as we you know as we work through a classification so here is a this is a landsat eight uh, channels two five and seven blue green red from uh, 2013 and this is a 24-bit color composite so there's you know 16.7 million possible colors or possible values in these pixels with 24 bits in each pixel three channels three uh, 16 bit channels the raw rescaled to 8 bit in order to fit into our VGA displays that we have in all of our computers so this is a more or less you would consider as a color composite or a an image that shows quite a bit of complexity to it you know it's hard I mean you can see there is some vegetation there is certainly some water here but there's um, you know the there's a lot of um, there's there's just a lot of complexity in this image that uh, you know could could use some sorting out so here's an unsupervised classification with eight classes so in effect uh, we took the uh, a multispectral image from that Landsat 8 image or multispectral uh, composite from that that um, Landsat 8 image and we uh, set the number of classes as eight classes and so now we have very firm hard decisions on uh, pixels and you can see that water gets classed pretty much as water uh, and uh, the you know the other areas are industrial areas there are urban areas there is uh, vegetation uh, green space so there's um, you know there's more there's also you know quite a bit of transportation that shows in this in this um, classification so again we've moved from complexity 16.7 million possible colors and actually many many more possible values than that probably with um, you know 16 three 16 bit just three 16 bit channels if that was 16 bit color or 48 bit color it could be up to 281 trillion possible values in each pixel okay so uh, we've gone from that to eight values okay and these eight values probably once we had done a little bit of field work we would probably give these values names they would be like land cover names like you know heavy industry or light industry or transportation or um, you know forest or um, residential areas and possibly different densities of residential areas or water so there's you can see that this becomes more useful and it starts looking perhaps more like a map once it's been uh, once it's been classified so we start out with and again this just to give us a sense of where these numbers where these numbers come from and 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 how they are derived this is a, a diagram you, you become somewhat familiar with but if you think about where are the where are the TM channels and again these are similar to the Landsat 8 channels usually a little bit wider in their range on the um, on the electromagnetic spectrum uh, and so you can see we're across the visible and in through the near and mid infrared on the horizontal scale here and then we have percent reflectance which you can think of as if it's 8-bit ranging from 0 to 255 here at 
at you know zero to 100 percent reflecting. So then we have these four different types of land cover. So you can see that how they vary across this wavelength range. But when you apply the thematic mapper to it, this is what you get. There's channel one, and these are really pretty close to the uh, approximate ranges of this these channels in the thematic mapper um, scanner. So channel one, channel two, green, so there's blue and green. Here's red, a little bit more narrow. Um, and, you know, you can see right on the edge of the visible. And then here's the near infrared. These are discrete channels, so there's usually a little bit of a gap between each channel, making them discrete, no overlap. And so there's uh, channel four, near infrared. Here's channel five. You can see they're getting a bit wider in their wavelength range in order to get enough uh, energy to get a signal in the sensor. And then here's uh, here's uh, channel seven. And so when you look at these, you say, okay, look, there's quite a bit of variability even within this range here and here. But in fact, what, you know, what we get is we get the area under the curve. And so you're going to get a single value, a single 8-bit value here that is somewhere between here and here in terms of reflectance. So you're going to get a reflectance measurement or an integer number that is, um, you know, an estimate that comes from the area under this curve. That would be the, this is probably the best graphical representation of that. And again, you can see you're going to get a single number here. And think about this. I mean, look at how much it changes in the red. So this is a pretty coarse way to measure um, a, a, a spectral reflectance curve. If you're trying to characterize this curve, you've really only got, you know, six integers, six 8-bit integers on this scale over here to try to characterize these really pretty complex uh, reflectance curves for each of these different types of land cover, right? So here's the classification process, just in um, in kind of in a, a snapshot. And this is the supervised classification process. So you start off with a an image data set here, multispectral image data set, each pixel uh, having, in this instance, it's showing five different uh, channels or five different layers. And we go through a training stage where you pick small polygons, you actually digitize small polygons that will be samples for each of the types of land cover that you're trying to identify. So you, you digitize these polygons and it, the, in the classification stage, it, uh, the system will extract information across all the channels that you have in your composite to characterize each of these different types of land cover and makes decisions ultimately in the classification. It makes decisions on a pixel by pixel basis based on different types of algorithms, different, different possible uh, solutions to that problem. How do you identify a type of land cover based on a sample that you've extracted based on the statistics from that sample, how do you identify in a single pixel which class it belongs in? So it's done, the classification is done on a pixel by pixel basis, and you output a classified image that instead of having, you know, these very, very uh, complex, long uh, numbers, you have a decision about what type of land cover is in a particular pixel. So this graphic represents uh, six different scatter plots for six different training samples that you've selected for six different types of land cover, as we uh, saw in the previous previous um, diagram. And so these uh, these are presented to us 
in two band space. But again, you have to remember you're going to be classifying with six or seven or eight or nine or ten or sometimes many more possible channels, as, as we'll see later. Uh, and so you, you have um, here we're just looking at it in two band space. So you get a sense for how these things tend to cluster together. But ultimately, when you go beyond three dimensions, we can't really represent this graphically. So it becomes typically with these uh, classification schemes, it becomes a, a, a longer and longer uh, polynomial equation that's used to make decisions about individual pixels based on the statistics from each of these samples that you've taken. So uh, as, as we look at, we're, we're going to look at a couple of different um, classification schemes here or approaches or algorithms to solving this problem. Uh, one of these is the minimum distance to the mean. So you can see there's a mean value for each of these samples plotted uh, in the center of each of these scatter plots. And then you have a couple of unknown pixels here. Pixel 1, just for example, uh, it, the test here in this two-band, two-channel space is which mean is it closest to in just Cartesian or Euclidean distance. And you can see this one here, uh, pixel 1, that plots here is the closest to the corn. So it's going to be identified as corn because that's the closest uh, mean in of these six means. Here's another scheme. This is a um, relatively popular scheme. It, it's, it's pretty fast. It's a, it's a hard classifier. And a parallel pipette is more or less a min max um, uh, test around these samples. So in two, uh, two band space, these min max uh, polygons look like uh, rectangles, right? And so in this case, look what happens. The pixel that we identified with minimum distance to the mean as uh, corn now gets classified as hay. Okay, so things can change from one approach to another approach, right? Uh, and you can also see there's there's some ambiguity. So this is just kind of an odd classifier. So here you have, you know, some pixels that are in the sample for both of these, uh, both of these uh, land cover types, hay and corn. There's quite a bit of overlap between the two, uh, these two samples. So again, this can cause problems ultimately with a classifier when you when you have that kind of ambiguity. Uh, this is a this is an interesting classifier, and this is one that we uh, will probably use in our supervised classification that we're going to do here uh, coming up. The uh, maximum likelihood classification um, it calculates using the stats that we have. It calculates a probability function for each of these uh, samples for each of these types of land cover. And then, so what we're looking at here is we're actually looking at six different probability functions plotted into a single uh, single Cartesian space. And we might be able to visualize this a little better with, um, you know, with a three-dimensional diagram. But again, this is six different functions, a composite of six different functions plotted into a, uh, now a three-dimensional space space with the, the z value being the probability function. You know, high probability is a very high peak on these bumps and lower probability is, you know, a, low, a lower peak. Uh, so, you know, and again, within each of these, they have a structure to them. It gives you a sense of the shape of this function in Cartesian, you know, now in three-dimensional Cartesian space. So, you know, there are some different approaches, and, and you'll see in the activity we have coming up that, um, you know, it's, these are, this is a, uh, it's, it's a powerful technique, and it, uh, you know, it, it's something that um, is, is very, you know, it's very powerful, very widely used, 
Uh, and, you know, I could show you some examples of this where, you know, where it's been used all over the United States. It's used uh, quite a lot by states, federal government uh, for different, you know, different land cover uh, studies that um, really, really impact many, many of the, of the policies and um, allocations of resources and so on that we have in, in uh, certainly in federal and state governments. So, again, just an example here. Here's a 24-bit color composite. Again, 16.7 million possible colors here in VGA color. And then here's a 14-class supervised classification. So this is our goal in classification is to go from complexity and, uh, you know, it's a beautiful image, but it's a very complex image. You know, it's difficult to, um, you know, make sense of perhaps uh, if you're a, a planner or a decision maker or, you know, someone who uh, is not a, you know, a remote sensing analyst who's, who's able to make some sense of this using classification and producing 14 different classes where, you know, where we have uh, you know, and something that looks more like a map, something that we're going to be able to use for um, for analysis more uh, effectively, but also uh, for uh, decision makers and decision makers making sense of their communities and their, um, you know, their jurisdictions. So image classification.